Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we begin our study, let's make sure we're in fellowship, so we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can come before your throne of grace, that you have always dealt with us in grace, that you have given us everything we need in grace, and you have, above all things, given us a salvation that is based on grace through faith. Father, we thank you that you have given us your word through grace once again, that we have the wisdom of the ages that we can study and learn, and that it gives us perspective and understanding, gives us comfort, gives us hope, gives us confidence. Father, now as we continue to study in Hebrews, we pray that you would help us to understand the things that we study, that we might have a greater appreciation for what we're reading, all that you've provided for us in our spiritual life and our spiritual destiny. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Before we get started in Hebrews 1, 2, there's a, something came across my email the other day that I thought was particularly relevant to tonight's clause in Hebrews 1, 2. This was posted on the website for <coughs> Answers in Genesis. Answers in Genesis is a creationist organization headed up by Ken Ham. It's located up in the... <coughs> southern part of one of those Yankee states just north of Kentucky, somewhere between Indiana and Pennsylvania. And it's, uh, uh, they're building a creationist museum up there. And this has come under some attack, and that's what this is referenced to. It's entitled A National Embarrass- Embarrassment by Ken Ham. Ken Ham is the director of AIG, and he used to be with uh, Creation Uh, research, the Institute for Creation Research. He writes, quote, in one of several recent salvos lobbed by the secular media at AIG USA and its future creation museum, a commentary on the online news service of USA Today declared last week, this was in February, that the museum near Cincinnati, Ohio is a national embarrassment. Here is Cantor's alarmist scaremongering in his own words. This just gives you an idea of the approach the evolutionists have from their pagan, uh, secular, evolutionist worldview. Cantor writes, quote, If we still had an Aristotelian view of the world, that is, four elements, air, earth, fire, and water, we'd never accept chemistry. Without chemistry, Material science disappears, and with it an untold number of better cars, safer packaging, more fuel-efficient airplanes, and who knows what else. If we didn't accept quantum mechanics, he writes, we never would have realized how electron orbits worked or how those electrons give off photons as they drop from one energy level to another. So we wouldn't have lasers. No lasers, no CDs, no DVDs, no laser surgery, no fiber optics. Thomas Edison couldn't have made a light bulb without understanding oxidation. Ken Ham comments, It's a shame that Cantor couldn't mention the incredible MRI technology since that was pioneered by the creationist Dr. Raymond Damadian. It was actually the creationist Robert Boyle who fathered modern chemistry and demolished the Aristotelian four elements theory. 
He also funded lectures to defend Christianity and sponsored missionaries and Bible translation work. Lasers depend on electromagnetic radiation theory, which was pioneered by creationist James Clerk Maxwell. More specifically, Einstein, who first proposed the stimulated emission of radiation that's the basis of lasers, frequently acknowledged his debt to Maxwell. The creationist Wright brothers invented the airplane after studying God's design of birds. Oxidation was discovered by Antoine Lavoisier, who was beheaded under the rabidly anti-Christian French reign of terror on the grounds that, quote, the Republic has no need of scientists, unquote. This is an unambiguous example of persecution of science by an atheistic, deistic regime. And of course, we'd better scratch Newton, Pascal, Joule, Pasteur, and the other creationist founders of modern science. It's true that the Creationist Museum is going to be one of those national embarrassments. It will be an embarrassment to the secular education system and secular media that have not taught students to think critically and have indoctrinated them in a false understanding of science and origins. Cantor is a product of such a system. In fact, we fear for the future of technology when generation, uh, generations of people like Cantor become the leaders in this culture. By his reasoning, he would have suppressed Newton because he wrote more about the Bible than about science. The Creation Museum will do what the education system should have been doing all along, teaching people how to think, explaining science correctly, and presenting the truth about who we are and how the universe came into being. Creation isn't just some secondary doctrine. It's not essential to the gospel. It's not essential to salvation. But if you're going to really understand the gospel, our salvation, you have to understand that there is a creator God that created everything and to whom all mankind is answerable and accountable. That's why whenever Paul addressed the the pagan audiences in Acts 14, Acts 17, he didn't start with the gospel. He didn't sit down and say, well, do you want to know how to have a happy and meaningful life? Do you want to know God's four spiritual laws? He started off with the fact that there was a God who made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. He started with creation. The interesting thing is, although it's evident from the context of Acts 17 that eventually he did get to the cross in the gospel, when he was on Mars Hill, he didn't get to the gospel because he was just ridiculed by all of the know-it-all secular philosophers and scientists of Athens at the time. Which reminds me of an announcement I forgot to give Tuesday night. we got to spread around a little bit. Last Sunday afternoon, somebody told me they went home and they watched uh, Ed Heinsohn's show. What's the name of Ed's show? The King is Coming. It's on TBN. Now, this is one of the few things that's on TBN. That's Trinity Broadcasting Network, for those of you who don't know. Uh, It's one of the few things on TBN that's that's doctrinally squared away. And uh, it's The King is Coming. It was originally done by um, uh, another uh, David Brees, another uh, 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 dispensationalist, and he died a few years ago, so Ed Heinsohn took it over. Now, Ed Ed is a, uh, he's the assistant to uh, Jerry Falwell, to, assistant to the Chancellor at Liberty University, and Ed's real solid. He's on the board for the Pre-Trib Research Group, and I got to r- really get to know him last summer when I went on that trip to Greece with uh, Randy, uh, I mean with Tommy, and with uh, Tim LaHaye. And when we were on that trip in Greece last year, as we went to all the different sites, different pastors in the group got up and talked about the places where we were and related them to Scripture. And Tommy gave the message at the Areopagus at Mars Hill on Acts 17, and Ed aired that last Sunday on The King is Coming. That means that sometime in the next two or three weeks, he's going to air the segment on judgment and rewards in the judgment seat filmed at the Bema seat in Corinth that I did. So that's something that if you don't have anything else to do on a Sunday afternoon and you want to turn on The King is Coming and watch that a little bit, you might want to do that and see if that comes on. Okay, now I didn't talk about creation just out of the blue. It's important. I could have 
talked about this on Tuesday night when we're in Genesis, but it specifically relates to our subject in the next clause in Hebrews. Next, if I can find the PowerPoint again. There we go. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, we started off recognizing that this is a temporal clause after God spoke in a variety of fragments and in various forms in time past. See, there's an embedded understanding that God operates in different ways in history just in the, the, the basic overview of Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. That there was a time past from the writer's perspective when God revealed things in a fragmentary way and in various forms, uh, various different means of revelation. We're missing something, Bruce? Okay, just hook it up. I'll keep going. After God spoke in a variety of fragments and in various forms in time past to the fathers by means of the prophets, He has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. And last time I did a study on these last days and made the point of emphasizing that you have to distinguish whether the last days in context are talking about the last days of the church or the last days of Israel. The last days of the church began with the ascension of Jesus Christ and the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Once the church age began, we entered the latter days because in this verse, these last days is cotemporaneous with the entire church age. So whether you lived in 100 or whether you lived in 1900, you're living in the last days of the church because Jesus Christ can return at any moment. It's imminent. But we're not living in the last days of Israel. And in the Old Testament, you'll find various phrases that we went over last time, the latter days, the end times, the last days, the last day. All these phrases relate to that final seven-year period in Israel's history, known as the time of Jacob's trouble, and specifically related to God's discipline on Israel, the time of Jacob's trouble, otherwise known as Daniel's 70th week or the tribulation, that that is... That is the latter days or the last days for Israel. So you have to make that distinction. And see, we dispensationalists are always uh, attacked because we always want to categorize and systematize everything. Well, the reason you can categorize and systematize the Scripture is because they're the product of a rational mind. They're the product of the rational mind of God who's thought all things through. And therefore, you can analyze, categorize, and classify and systematize what God has done. This is why, we can, why science has a basis in fact, is because God, who is rational in his thinking, created all things according to fixed kinds. And man has a mind that is an analog to the uh, mind of the Creator. And therefore, we can go out and through empiricism and rationalism, we can discover those categories and classify things. And the same thing is true about Bible doctrine. There's a lot of comparison. It's fascinating between the science and the study of science and the study of nature and the Bible. In the study of nature, you have all of this that's out there, the beauty of nature, whether it's uh, the rocks and the minerals, uh, trees, birds, animals, everything. It's just like raw data. And it's part of our function as being in the image and likeness of God and image bearers to go out and study, analyze, categorize, classify God's creation. And from that, we develop knowledge, which is what science means. So God, God didn't give us a science textbook. He gave us the creation, and then we study it, and from that we gain knowledge as we properly apply the principles of, of reason and logic. Well, the same thing is true with Scripture. God gave us Scripture. He specifically chose certain episodes and laid them out down through history in the 2,000 years roughly covered in the writing of, or 1,500 years in the writing of Scripture and the 4,000 years of the biblical period from creation up to the death of the last apostle, you have 
just a few episodes of everything that could have been put in there. I mean, you think about all the things that happened in human history that happened over that 4,000 year period of time, and yet we just have a microcosm. But it is a sovereignly chosen microcosm that is designed to give us a precise understanding of the plans, the purposes of God, his outworking, and to reveal his character and how he interacts with his creatures. And so uh, man learns about God by taking the historical revelation of God that's uh, encapsulated for us in the canon of the scripture. And as we study it through the use of our own intellect and reason that God gave us under the authority of God, then we're able to go in and categorize, classify, and systematize the revelation. And that's how we learn about God. That's how we know who is all about his attributes. And we then develop vocabulary just as Adam developed vocabulary to explain what God has Reveal to him. And as we develop that technical vocabulary, you have the origin of words like sovereignty, omniscient. Just look the word sovereignty up in a concordance sometime. You won't find it. Look, look up omniscience. You won't find it. Look up omnipotence. You won't find it. But those words clearly communicate what is there in the scripture. Look up words like trinity. They're not there. It's the result of man under the authority of God and through the leading of God and teaching of God the Holy Spirit studying all of the the data that's given here in terms of narrative and history and uh, epistolary instruction and then categorizing classifying all of this and systematizing it so that we come to a, a, a more and more profound understanding of who God is and how he works in history. So we take that and this is the basis for how we then study the scriptures. So there's a former times and there's a latter times. There's at least, from these two verses, we know there's at least two dispensations or two periods of history. There is the former times where God spoke in a fragmentary manner to Israel through the prophets. And there's these last days, the church age spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things. And the very concept of being appointed an heir but not being established an heir implies a future era or age where that inheritance comes to reality. So the phrase, the heir of all things, focuses on even a future dispensation. It always surprises people when you talk about dispensations that in the Dallas Seminary catalog, they only talk about three dispensations, the Old Testament, the church age, and the future kingdom. And these are the only technically three dispensations. They're specifically spelled out in scripture, but there are more. So in these last days, God has spoken to us by means of his son as the ultimate revelation of God. And I pointed out that Jesus Christ didn't reveal anything to us in terms of propositional written down scripture. That was done through the apostles so that the apostles be expressed uh, what, what he thought, what he taught and under the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. They write down uh, what was communicated uh, from him and then they go on through, as the Holy Spirit develops that doctrine for the church age. As in these last days spoken to us by means of his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. And so we went through a study last time on inheritance. And we talked about the fact that inheritance has an heirship and this whole word group has as its core meaning the idea of possession or ownership. And this whole idea gets developed in the second chapter of Hebrews as we understand that Jesus Christ is made lower than the angels so that he can be elevated above the angels, which is what happens at the ascension and session, so that he can then have authority over all things, not simply as the second person of the Trinity in his deity, but as the crown of creation as a human being in hypostatic union as the God-man. So the son, remember the main clause in these three ver- or four verses at the beginning of Hebrews is that God has spoken to us by means of his son. And the, the term son is then ex- 
further uh, defined as the one whom he has appointed heir of all things, and secondly, through whom also he made the worlds. And this is the phrase that we're looking at this evening, through whom he made the worlds. And I can already hear some of you thinking that if we're going to go through clause, one clause at a time, one week at a time, we're going to be in Hebrews for the rest of our lives. Well, we may be, but uh, we'll move a little faster once we get out of these first four or five verses. They are so loaded with uh, pregnant phrases. And by that, I mean e- each clause says something about a key theme in the uh, epistle that as we unpack all of this, it's going to lay the groundwork for us to understand and move a little faster once we get out of the, out of the preface. Through whom also he made the worlds is the Greek f- phrase based on the preposition dia. It's got a little apostrophe there because you have a, the, the, the vowel dropped out uh, because it's followed by a, uh, the, the negative uh, or excuse me, the relative pronoun who. So dia who uh, represents the intermediate agency. It's dia uh, plus the genitive indicating intermediate agency that God is the one who is the ultimate source of creation but he uses, utilizes Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, as the intermediate agent for this action. So that's the significance of the through. It is through the intermediate agency of the Lord Jesus Christ, he also made. And this is a generic word for creation. The verb, the Greek verb poieo, the aorist active indicative, it is a consummative uh, aorist indicating a completed process, looking at it as finished in time past, through whom also he, that is God the uh, Father, made the world. So God the Father made the worlds through the Lord Jesus Christ. But then we get to that phrase, worlds, and we have to do a little corrected translation there. See, in, in our era of science fiction, when you think of making the worlds, people immediately think of all kinds of different planets out there and different worlds and different universes and the Star Trek and the Starship Enterprise going from uh, galaxy to galaxy and discovering all kinds of people who inhabit uh, the, the universe. That's not what this is talking about. The word here is the Greek noun ionos. Ionos, and it means ages. It refers to a period of time, a period of time in human history. So it should be translated through whom God made the ages. And of course, that implies creation. And of course, we know from other passages that Jesus Christ was the intermediate agent through whom God created all things. But that's not the word that we have here. This is not specifically talking about uh, creation, ex nihilo, that creation out of nothing that occurred in Genesis 1-1. But this is talking about all of human history, that it is through Jesus Christ that God the Father made the ages of history. So with this, I want to take some time to step back and talk about something that we spoke of a lot in the conference this last week, but it's also uh, important to understand in, in the, as a background for Hebrews, and that is the, the whole doctrine of dispensations. The whole doctrine of dispensations, and that there are four different words used that are related to uh, this this time concept and, and what we call dispensations or the ages. And the place to start is in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, a verse that we touched on at the conference this last week when the disciples have gathered together around the Lord Jesus Christ immediately prior to his ascension. And they're standing around waiting, getting their marching orders uh, and Jesus' final commands to them before he departs to heaven And when they came together, we're told in verse 6, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, this is a crucial question to understand that even 40 days after the resurrection, they expect a physical, literal kingdom where Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning on the throne of David to be initiated at any moment. 
And so they say, Lord, is it now that you're going to uh, restore the kingdom to Israel? And when they use that phrase to Israel, they're not just, that indicates they're not talking about some sort of spiritual, ethereal kingdom. This isn't a kingdom that's in your heart. This isn't an allegorical kingdom. This is a literal, physical kingdom. And the reason we know that is because you've got all of the Old Testament to understand. They're understanding the concept of a kingdom in Israel just as they did back under Solomon and under David and under the uh, kings in the Old Testament. They're expecting a geopolitical kingdom that is restored to Israel because that's exactly what was promised in the Old Testament from the, the covenants to the prophets all through the ages. But Jesus doesn't correct them in their understanding that there is a promise and there is a future literal kingdom to Israel coming. He doesn't do that. He doesn't say, well, you got the whole concept all wrong. You've never understood this. You, you just keep trying to interpret the Old Testament in a literal fashion. You keep trying to use a literal hermeneutic. Every time I talk about kingdom, you know, don't you know you have to use allegory and spiritualize everything? Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times. They wanted to know when. He says it's not for you to know the times. He doesn't say it's not going to happen. He says it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, I think in King James. New American Standard translates it epochs. The two key words that are used here are the Greek words chronos and kairos. Chronos and kairos. Now these are important to understand a couple of things. The first word chronos emphasizes events in succession events in succession. So if we put it here on the overhead, you have one event after another in terms of history, and it implies that things are moving in a specific direction, thus implying that history has meaning and purpose. This isn't just a, a lot of random stuff that just kind of fell out of the out of space and just landed in this order, which is what evolution teaches, but that, that time is moving in a direction. Uh, in fact, Galatians uh, 4 4 says that it was in the fullness of time, and that's a word familiar to all of us, pleroma, that which is brought to completion. In the fullness of time, chronos, C-H-R-O-N-O-S, in the fullness of time, Jesus Christ was born of a woman. And that indicates something that before Jesus Christ could be born in approximately 4 B.C., God had to set the stage. It couldn't just happen. In order for it to have the kind of efficacy that was necessary for mankind, the human race, to be ready to accept and to receive the Messiah, there had to be a stage setting that took place. And this is the purpose of everything that occurred in the Old Testament. The uh, ages of the Gentiles from Adam to Abraham, the age of the Jews from Abraham up to Jesus Christ. And there were sub, sub periods of time in there we'll get to in a minute called dispensations. And each one of these periods had a divine purpose. And it all is moving in a direction to prepare the uh, human race for the coming of the Messiah. So chronos refers to events in succession. The second word that's used there is the word kairos. Kairos, which is a word that indicates a broader expanse of time that has certain definable characteristics. We would uh, perhaps use the word ages, same as we do with ionos. So there's a, uh, an overlap between these two words that we see here, between Ionos and Kairos. And this has to do with the concept of age. Now, what I want to do here as we think about this is I want to pull together a couple of different things for us on dispensation just so we we understand terminology. Age has to do with long periods of time that have certain 
definable characteristics. There are certain things that they have in common. And where we're going to go with this is we're going to say that there's one age relates to Gentiles, and that's from Adam to the call of Abram. Then we have another lengthy period of time in the Old Testament, and this is the age of the Jews. And that begins with Abram's circumcision in Genesis chapter 17 and goes up to the cross. Then we have the church age, and then we'll have the millennial age or the kingdom age. And culmination, the tribulation is the last seven years related to the age of the Jews. Now those are, that's age looking at it in terms of broad expanses of time. We haven't gotten to dispensations yet. We're starting big and we're working our way down. Now, the other word that we're used to is one I've just mentioned, and that's the word dispensation. The word dispensation. And the word dispensation is really derived from a Greek word, oikonomos. Oikonomos. Let's see if I did a slide on this. Uh, Greek word oikonomos. O-I-K-O-N-O-M-O-S. And this is the word that is usually translated dispensation. And this word really has the idea of an administration. It is, it's, it's not a time factor. You know, we talk about dispensation so often the way, we, the way we use it. The way we use dispensation is we think of it in terms of time, but the word itself, oikonomos, doesn't have anything to do with time. It has to do with the characteristics of how a period of time are managed or administrated, administered. So that it doesn't focus on time factors. Ionos focuses on time factors, but oikonomos indicates the characteristics of how a steward or manager governs or runs that period of time. So the time factor goes into the background. Now in Acts 1-6, the disciples in approximately 33 AD say, well, what, when are you going to establish the kingdom? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. Kronos and Kairos, it's not for you to know them. 33 AD, you aren't supposed to know this information. But then in 51 A.D., so almost 20 years later, some 18 years later, Paul writes at the end of his second missionary journey, sends a letter back to the uh, believers in Thessaloniki, and he says, Now as to the times, chronos, and the seasons or epochs, kairos, see the same words that are used in Acts 1, he says, Now as to the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need for anything to be written to you. Why? Because I taught you all about the times and the seasons when I was there face to face. In 31 AD, Jesus told the disciples, it's not for you to know. In other words, at that point in time, that revelation had not been given to the apostles. But by 51, that information had been given to the apostles, primarily through the Apostle Paul, and was being communicated by the Apostle Paul to church-age believers in preparing them for an understanding of the church age. So when you juxtapose Acts 1-6 and 1 Thessalonians 5-1, we realize that there is divine revelation regarding the times and the seasons, and this is what we call a study of dispensations. So we have the word age, meaning a period of time in human history, and then we have the word dispensation, which really translates the word oikonomos, which also is translated stewardship or administration. You have those parables in Luke where Jesus talks about the landowner who leaves and he puts his steward in charge. He's an oikonomos. He is a steward. He is the one who who oversees and administers the uh, landowner's property and all of his possessions. So the word oikonomos emphasizes the responsibility delegated by God to the human race during a period of time. 
It emphasizes responsibility. It emphasizes the fact that at different periods of time, God manages or administers human history in different ways. Now, sure, there are certain things that are held in common throughout all the ages. Salvation is always by grace through faith. The purpose of the Mosaic Law was never to provide a way for salvation. The law was never the means that a Jew gained salvation. The law was designed for sanctification purposes, that is the ritual part. If you look at it in terms of the overall history of, uh, of Israel in the Old Testament, their salvation or redemption took place first when they went through the Red Sea, and then they had the giving of the law. So the giving of the law was given to the nation as a redeemed nation. So dispensation then is understood as a distinct and identifiable administration in the development of God's plan and purposes for human history. That's just a nutshell definition of dispensation. Dispensation. A few years ago, I was, uh, we were being visited by a friend who had grown up in a denomination that's fairly conservative and fairly well known for teaching the gospel or teaching the Bible. And not only that, but uh, this individual came from a family that had produced a number of missionaries and preachers. And I used the word dispensation, and it was like a blank stare, you know, just like somebody uh, I could have been talking about filling out an income tax return or something or, or accounting principles. They just went blank. And I said, well, you, you know what a dispensation is? have no idea what a dispensation is. What's dispensationalism? What's a dispensation? And see, especially those of you who are little bit older, a little bit grayer, you, were, you got started reading the King James Version, and the King James translated this word group, uh, oikonomos, or economia, with the word dispensation. But that dropped out, and, and later versions, more modern versions, like New American Standard, New King James, prefer to use a word like administration uh, rather than dispensation, although it's still used in a couple of places. So the word dispensation refers to this management issue that there are administration differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We know that in one sense, anybody who's not going to Jerusalem to sacrifice a lamb on, on Passover is a dispensationalist. In one sense, if they don't believe in dispensationalism, it's just that they're an inconsistent dispensationalist and they haven't figured it out yet. Jesus Christ was the end of the law. So it is, this is our basic working definition of dispensation. It's a distinct and identifiable administration in the development of God's plan and purposes for human history. And note that, I mean, that God has a plan and a purpose to history. It's not random. You know, things were done a certain way between Adam and Noah in order to teach that man could not function independently of the Creator. They didn't have a written canon of Scripture. God was present on the planet. There were other characteristics I've noted as we've studied through that, but man failed. And then you have another change after the Noahic covenant is given. And again, man fails at the Tower of Babel, and, and we'll, we'll see this in a minute. But these are these, they are identifiable characteristics in each of these dispensations. It's clear from all of this, that God has a plan and God is working it out. The apostles understood there's a distinct things that are happening in distinct periods of time. Paul develops that. It affects not only uh, it affects not only history, but it affects understanding of the spiritual life because there are different characteristics related to the spiritual life. The principle of grace through faith still operates, but you don't have the Holy Spirit given to each believer in the Old Testament. You do have the Holy Spirit given to each believer in the New Testament. There's no baptism of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. You have baptism of the Holy Spirit for every believer in the New Testament. You don't have the filling of the Spirit in the Old Testament. You do have the filling of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Uh, The Holy Spirit is the means of living the Christian life in the New Testament and not in, in the Old Testament. Doctrine related to God's plan was clearly 
uh, revealed in this dispensation, and it had not been revealed in earlier dispensations. So Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. It's not like a whodunit. It is previously hidden or unrevealed information that is now being disclosed to man. We speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. So, we talk about this in terms of dispensation. Now, let's just think about the English word a minute. The English word dispensation comes from the Latin word dispensatio, which translates a Greek word meaning to weigh out, to dispense, and the main idea is to deal out, dispense, or distribute something. So it comes to refer to the distribution of goods and that the Greek word oikonomia, listen to this, listen with your ears, oikonomia and economy. Hear the similarity? Oikonomia and economy. That's where we get our word economy. It's a distribution of goods and services. That's economy. So it has the same root as as dispensation. According to... Webster's Dictionary, the word dispensation means a divine ordering and administration of worldly affairs. Notice that's the first meaning listed in the dictionary. Covenant theologians, wake up. The divine ordering and administration of worldly affairs. Incidentally, if you don't know, most covenant theologians believe in dispensations. They just don't believe in dispensationalism. And the core issue in dispensationalism is the distinction between God's plan for Israel and God's plan for the church. So that's how we're using this word is the divine ordering and administration of worldly affairs. The Greek word economy is a word from which we get our word ecumenical, economy, Uh, It's the idea of management, regulation, administration, and planning. C.I. Schofield, who was a decorated uh, Confederate uh, Civil War veteran, uh, became an alcoholic after the war. He was a lawyer, and then he was saved, came uh, under the um, uh, ministry of a Presbyterian uh, minister in St. Louis, who taught him about dispensations. And then later on, he became a well-known Bible teacher. He was personally responsible for mentoring uh, Lewis Berry Chafer, who founded Dallas Seminary. But C.I. Schofield put dispensationalism on the map when he published his study Bible. And he defined a dispensation as a period of time during which man is tested in respect of obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God a period of time in which man is tested in respect of obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. I think that's a very strong addition that he made. There is in each of these dispensations some revelation from God with a correlative test, and man always fails the test. He's demonstrating again that man the creature can't have any measure of success without being consistently dependent upon God the Creator. Graham Scroggie, who was another well-known Bible teacher of the first part of the 20th century and dispensationalist, defines it this way. The word oikonomia bears one significance, and it means an administration, whether of a house or property, of a state or a nation, or as in the present study, the administration of the human race or any part of it at any given time. Just as a parent would govern his household in different ways, according to varying necessity, yet ever for one good end, so God has at different times dealt with men in different ways, according to the necessity of the case, but throughout for one great grand end. Oikonomos is a compound word in the Greek, oikos meaning house, namos meaning law, house law. And when you were a kid growing up, you had one set of laws in the house, When you were three years old, you had another set when you were eight, you had another set when you were 13, and another set when you were 18, and hopefully another set when you were 25. And as you went through those different stages, how your parents dealt with you in terms of responsibilities and privileges differed from one age to another. Charles Ryrie wrote a well-known book that I recommend called Dispensationalism. It was originally called uh, Dispensationalism Today, and then he revised it in the late 90s to deal with uh, issues that had come up in the 30 years since it was originally published. He defined a dispensation as a distinguishable economy 
in the outworking of God's purposes, a distinguishable economy in the outworking of God's purposes. So you see there's a certain pattern that runs through these definitions. And then a couple of years ago, I was asked to write an article on dispensationalism for the Tim LaHaye Prophecy Study Bible, and I defined it this way. I really just operated on all these others and merged things together and sought a little clarification. A dispensation, therefore, is a distinct and identifiable administration. That indicates it has certain characteristics that set each dispensation apart from others. A distinct and identifiable administration in the development of God's plan and purposes for human history. Ephesians 3.2, Colossians 1.25-26. A closely connected but not interchangeable word is age, the Greek word ion, which introduces the time element. God manages the entirety of human history as a household, moving humanity through sequential stages of his administration, determined by the level of revelation he has provided up to that time in history. See, there's progressive revelation. Abraham knew more than Noah. Moses knew more than Abraham. Uh, Elijah knew more than Moses. Uh, Isaiah knew more than Elijah. Uh, John the Baptist and the apostles knew more than Uh, Isaiah did. John the Apostle knew more than uh, John the Baptist knew. So there's progressive revelation. Each administrative period is characterized by revelation that specifies responsibilities, a test in relation to those responsibilities, failure to pass the test, in other words, man always fails, and God's gracious provision of a solution when failure occurs. God's grace always solves the problem. So let's look at this in terms of a chart. Work our way through. You have in the Old Testament the age of the Gentiles and the age of Israel. But those are subdivided. The first dispensation is the dispensation of perfect environment. Schofield called it innocence. Now, innocence is really a good word. It's gotten a bad rap because of the way we use it. We think of innocence as some sort of uh, uh, sophomoric uh, naivete or something of that nature. But if we think of it in terms of a legal concept, which is what the Bible's all about, is these, this legal structure, innocence means not guilty. They're not guilty of sin. They are legally innocent in that sense. So it's a good word, but it's often misunderstood. So I use the term perfect environment. Now what moves human history through these sequential stages are covenants. God enters into a contract with man. So we have the initial creation covenant given in Genesis 1, uh, 26 to 28, and also mentioned in Hosea 6, 7, stipulating the, the conditions for that initial period. The responsibility is to fulfill the covenant and not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But man failed and he ate the fruit in Genesis chapter 3. And the consequent divine judgment was instant spiritual death, separation from God, and uh, then all the other consequences that reverberated through nature and through mankind. So God had to revise the contract. And we have a new age called the age of conscience. I'm not real happy with that term but I haven't found a better one. You have the age of conscience. This is based on the Adamic covenant, which is a modification of the original creation covenant. And these stipulations are given in Genesis 3, 14 through 19. The responsibility is to worship God through animal sacrifice. That God stipulates that it's not on the basis of human works, but on the basis of what he provides. And of course, man fails. The first failure is Cain when he tries to impress God with the fruit of his own work in the, in the harvest. Uh, the result of disobedience during that dispensation is evil and wickedness outlined in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. And so God is now going to judge the human race through a worldwide flood described in Genesis, uh, excuse me, that should be Genesis chapter 6 through Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 6 through Genesis chapter 9. Then there's a change. There's another covenant given. After the flood, Noah and his family, the eight, get off the ark. They sacrifice to God. God enters into a new contract or covenant with them. And this is called the Noahic covenant, Genesis 9, 1 through 17. 
The responsibility, again, is to fill the earth. Remember the beginning, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, man was to fill the earth and subdue it. Now he's to fill the earth, but there are other consequences now, for there is uh, warfare tension between the animals and between man. There are also other aspects given, such as capital punishment being delegated to man. All of this is part of that contract. But man failed. Instead of filling the earth, he gathered together to make a name for himself and built the Tower of Babel. And there is judgment of the confusion of languages described in Genesis chapter 11, verses 5 through 9. That ends the age of the Gentiles. So the age of the Gentiles is clearly defined by three administrative periods that are defined by these legal contracts. So we see that what's, what's at the core of a dispensation is this, this legal contractual uh, uh, revelation given by God. Well, there's a change now, and he's going to work through one individual, Abram, which we've been studying in Genesis on Tuesday nights. So we have the dispensation of the patriarchs, because you see, when God enters into that covenant, it changes from just the way it was working before. You can't postpone the beginning of the age of Israel to the time that they become a nation. Because what's important first and foremost is the race that is based on the calling of Abraham and then Isaac, the promised seed, and then Jacob. So the age of Israel begins with the patriarchs and the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3, uh, established again where the, the formal ceremony in Genesis 15, the sign of circumcision in Genesis 17. So as part of this, the descendants of Abraham were to stay a distinct people. They weren't to intermarry. So when Abraham wants a wife for Isaac, he sends Eliezer back to uh, Haran to find, through his relatives, a bride for Isaac. Jacob does the same thing. And, uh, but then the sons of Jacob start intermarrying with the Canaanites, and that's going to bring judgment. They're going to become assimilated into the Canaanite culture, or the threat is there. And so God punishes them, disciplines them by sending them all down to Egypt so they will be in a hostile environment where the Egyptians hated the Semites, and they isolated them in Goshen. This allowed them to not be... Uh, not intermingle with the pagans surrounding them. Then they're freed at the Exodus event, and God gives them another covenant, a temporary covenant called the Mosaic Law, the Sinaitic Covenant, or the Old Covenant. And this is, uh, uh, this is laid out in Exodus 20 to 40. The principle there is to obey the law, and you will enjoy the blessings of the land. If you disobey the law, you're going to be kicked out of the land, but I will bring you back. They disobeyed, according to 2 Chronicles 36, 14, and they were removed from the land. They could not enjoy the blessings. It's still theirs positionally, but not experientially. It's tantamount to the sin unto death in the spiritual life today. And so they are in the diaspora, as outlined in Deuteronomy 28, 63 to 66. Now then we have a new age that enters in, the Messianic age. Now not all dispensationalists isolate the, uh, the Messianic age or the period of Christ's ministry is a separate dispensation. However, there have been several dispensationalists down through the years that have done that. Uh, it's not typical today, but there have been those who did. The uh, Presbyterian pastor who taught, uh, I always have trouble remembering his name, I always draw a blank there, but Presbyterian pastor who taught Schofield had an age he called the age of the Messiah. And that was a distinct dispensation. There is a test. There's a revelation. And that revelation is the Logos. Jesus is the revelation of God. Uh, there's a test to accept him as the Messiah. There is the failure of the test on the part of Israel. They rejected him as the Messiah. And there is a judgment. There is a judgment of the cross. And then there's the fifth cycle of discipline in AD 70. So you see, you can look at the dispensation of the Messiah or the hypostatic union, whatever you want to call it, and you can see that it has distinguishing characteristics just as the other dispensations do. 
after the resurre- resurrection and ascension of Christ, with the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, you have the church age. The new covenant is applied. That's a, I have the word established there. I need to change that. It's applied. It's established with Israel at the second coming. It is applied to the church age. Its basis, it, the responsibility is to trust in Christ as Savior, faith alone in Christ alone. Most people will reject Christ as their Messiah in this era. Just think of the billions of people on the face of the planet who have never heard of Jesus Christ. Most human beings in this age will never hear the gospel and have never heard the gospel. Most people reject Christ and the judgment at the end on the earth is the tribulation. The church, of course, is removed at the rapture. We don't go through the tribulation. The tribulation relates to the last seven years for Israel's history and that ends with the second coming of Jesus Christ. After the Battle of Armageddon, you go into uh, the Millennial Kingdom, and the, the responsibility there is to obey Christ. There's a failure even, at the, even in perfect environment. What God is showing is that environment isn't the issue. It is sin. It's volition. And at the end of the Millennial Kingdom, there will be another revolt, the second Gog and Magog revolt that's led by Satan when he's released from the lake of fire and then there's a judgment and they are all burned up and destroyed. And then the present heavens and earth are destroyed after the great white throne judgment and we enter into the new heavens and the new earth. So the main thing that I want you to get from this chart is that there are ages such as the age of the Gentiles, the age of Israel, the church age, the messianic age, the church age, and the millennial age. But then there are subdivisions known as dispensations. Now, in some cases, a dispensation and, a, and an age are identical, such as the messianic age or the church age or the millennial age. But in the Old Testament, the ages are subdivided into dispensations related to uh, these covenants that were given in the Old Testament. Now, this is what the writer of Hebrews is referring to when he says, through him, that is, through through Jesus Christ, through whom he, God the Father, made the ages. Jesus Christ controls history. But, of course, Jesus Christ also made everything. He was the intermediate agent for all creation. John 1.1, in the beginning was the Word, that is, Jesus Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and in verse 3 we read, All things were made through him, intermediate agency again, and without him nothing was made that was made. So Jesus Christ, God the Father is the architect who plans everything, and Jesus Christ is the uh, contractor on site through whom everything is made. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, For by him... All things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, that's angelic hierarchies. All things were created through him and for him, that is for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is before all things and in him, or literally by him, all things consist. That is, he is the one who continuously sustains the universe. So that takes us through Hebrews 1, 2 and focuses on the centrality of Jesus Christ as the creator and the one who, is, who lays out the ages and who is the one who controls history. So you can summarize that last clause in Hebrews 1, 2 that through whom he made the ages as simply Jesus Christ controls history and moves it to a destiny with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to once again realize the central role of the Lord Jesus Christ in creation and human history, and that he is the one who controls history, even when it seems as if things are out of control, and when it seems like periods of history that have seemed like the human race was on the verge of extinction. Nevertheless, Jesus Christ is in complete control. Things are never out of control, And he is moving everything to its final culmination, which will bring full honor and glory to himself.
Our Father, we pray that you would help us to understand the things we studied this evening, that we might be encouraged by them. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.